Welcome everybody to this second season of Shitco Talks. Uh, this season comes with many uh, novelties. One of them is that we'll have international guests uh, in this podcast. Last year, we started uh, when, with a special guest coming from Spain, uh, Aitor Vidibai, uh, nutritionist at Ineos Grenadiers. And this time, I wanted to invite also someone very special. Uh, also, given that we are going to start with this uh, international guest, uh, we are here with Stephen Saylor. I think that Stephen um, doesn't need any kind of introduction, any kind of presentation. Everybody knows him. But uh, if there's someone who is a little bit lost, uh, Stephen is currently professor at the University of Agder, Norway. He's a very prolific researcher, in my opinion, one of the uh, biggest researchers in endurance sports physiology uh, in the last decades. And he has also been a consultant for several endurance teams, such as the Uno X uh, cycling team in Norway, and professional athletes, and also brands such as Adidas. Many, many thanks, uh, Stefan, for accepting the invitation for this talk. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. So I brought Stefan here to talk about uh, several topics re regarding uh, endurance sports training and specifically cycling. Uh, um, uh, some of the research that uh, Stephen has performed uh, is related to training volume and intensity and also, also external and internal load metrics. So I would like to address these topics because I think that he has uh, a lot to tell us. So first question, Stephen, uh, during the last, uh, since the start of the century, we have seen uh, many new advances coming into the field of, of cycling. Um, we can talk about uh, the power meters, which have brought the opportunity to monitor external training load. Uh, we can talk about nutritional advances also in the means of carbohydrates, increasing amounts of carbohydrates in training. And this has also changed the training interventions. No? And here goes my question. Which have been, in your opinion, the biggest advances that we have had in our field in these last two decades? And what kind of changes they have brought in the in the way we are training the the athletes? Well, obviously, being able to measure power has been a big change, and and that is in but but that's very specific to cycling. So we have to remember that you know most endurance sports you can't measure power like in the same way in a field in the field, but in cycling we can, and so that's had I think that's had quite a bit of impact. However. I also believe that the top teams, we see that they understand a lot more about balancing uh, training stimuli and fatigue, you know, and, and they are reducing the number of races that the athletes do. They're a bit more careful to give them some periods during the season where they can go back to normal training. So there seems to be a better understanding of the, the, the fact that you have to keep your athletes healthy. And, and, and so that's, I, I see that in, in the data and, and in my discussions with teams. Uh, of course, nutrition in, in cycling has had a huge impact. I mean, we, we're seeing dramatic changes in the amount of carbohydrate intake uh, and, and kind of changing the assumptions about how much carbohydrate can be taken on, uh, rewriting the, the nutrition books in a way. Um, you could argue. So, so that's not my key area, but when I talk to pro cyclists, uh, they, they say the nutrition has been a really big change. Do you think that current athletes are much healthier than what it was two decades ago? Ah, yeah, I think at least we see that professional teams understand that their biggest resource is their athletes, that they're a team of 30, you know, that's the typical size of a world tour team and that they have to distribute that load at any given time of those 30, they're going to have athletes that are sick, injured, over fatigued. And they're, you know, so they have to be constantly managing that resource, which is their, their team. So I do think that there's a better understanding of that. And, and, and of course the behaviors of the athletes have also changed. You know, they, they were, they, think more about being a 24 hour athlete in the sense that, 
you know, sleep, nutrition, uh, stress recovery, and so forth. So it's not just the teams, but the athletes also understand this process better. Okay. And related to this, uh, one of the, uh, of the ways to improve athletes' health is to monitor uh, his training load. Yesterday, precisely, I was reading your, your chapter in Inigos Mujica's book uh, about training, when, where you talk about volume and intensity in endurance sports. And here goes my second question, which is, in your opinion, um, the most important one? I know it is not a yes or no answer, of course, but if you had to choose one, at which parameters would you look at to, to decide? For example, there are people who have not a lot of time to train. So maybe in those cases, you will prefer to choose more intensity versus volume. That, what's your opinion on this topic? Yeah, well, I always start with frequency. Is is just say the first thing you have to do is establish a habit of training. Uh, it, you know, so if it was your your mother and you wanted to get her off the sofa, and she wants to run a 10k in in a year, the first thing you're going to say is, well, Mama, let's agree on how many times you're going to get off the out the door. You're going to put your running shoes on. You're going to put on your, you know, the kit I bought you, the you know the warm up suit or whatever. And, 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 and then she says, well, okay, I can do that three times a week. And, and so you're going to try to establish that habit with her of getting out the door and just doing something. And then slowly the something, you'll stretch it out. And then only after a couple of months would you start talking to your mama about intensity, right? So, so and we've learned that from top, top athletes. We've learned that from endurance athletes is that the most important thing is, co is consistency that they are able to stay healthy and they're training very regularly. I mean, I'm just looking at data from a absolute world-class, you know, grand tour winning athlete and looking at their training in a, in a, in a February month. And it's, it's 94% low intensity green below the first threshold, you know, and this athlete five months later or six months later is winning big events. So, I think that's what we see is that intensity is, is the top of the pyramid. It's not the bottom. The bottom of the pyramid is frequency and volume is being able to now that frequency and volume for, uh, for recreational athletes can, is going to be a lot lower, but that's still what you're trying to make sure that you're defending. You're saying, I'm going to get out those four days a week. I'm going to keep my consistency going. And if that means I have to reduce the amount of hard training so that I recover, I'm going to do that. that yeah, one of, one of the main topics of your research, which I have read a lot, is that um, data from the analysis of top athletes shows that in endurance sports, they normally train a lot, mostly uh, quite easy and uh, with very specific boats of high intensity, no? which, which is what you're talking about. Will you, st will you still apply this to, to, to people who have very little time to train? Well, you know, if it's somebody that only trains three days a week. Yeah, a typical weekend warrior. For 45 minutes, you know, then they can do a lot of things wrong. And they're not really, they can't get overtrained because they're just not training enough. And they have a day of rest between each workout. So pretty much they can do whatever they want, but what's going to happen is if they train the same way all three days, they'll, they'll stagnate pretty quickly. So even with the three day a week athlete, I would try to have them do one of those workouts, have it be more extensive, longer to use the effect of duration on the, on the adaptations. And then I would have one of the, one of the workouts be more intensity oriented, something like an interval session. And then probably the third workout would be more just in the kind of in the middle. Uh, so even with a three day a week athlete, I would try to use both intensity and duration in a way that creates variation for them. It's not the same every day and the stimuli are a little bit different. And then, and then clearly we see if an athlete's training maybe seven or eight hours a week, for sure it makes a difference already with that kind of uh, volume that if they get the intensity distribution right, if they make sure easy stays easy and hard is hard, they tend to get better. We just see it time and time again. 
so I would say that we do, we can still learn from the 25 hour a week type athletes, even though we're only training a very small part of that. Uh, because what they show is, is discipline, making sure that they, they, they work their plan. You know, they, if my plan today is a two hour easy ride, then I, I'm going to achieve that. I'm not going to just turn it into something else as soon as somebody passes me on the road. That's the typical recreational rider, right? As soon as somebody cycles past me, here we go. I'm racing, right? I was going to just do an easy ride, but now my brain just went whoop. You know? yeah. So that's, that's what we see is the best athletes have better discipline up in their head. <laughs> Uh, that's an important take. You have briefly mentioned, I know this is an off topic, uh, overtraining syndrome. Do you, do you, I, I don't know how to formulate this question. Do you really believe uh, in overtraining syndrome as it is stated in, in science? Do you, do you have seen any cases? Yeah, I have. I've seen athlete careers end uh, because of a, a very clear overtraining syndrome. Now, do I understand it all? No, but I have definitely seen it. Uh, it's rare. I don't think it happens very often now. I, I do think that science has come along and the, the coaches are better. The athletes are better. I mean, the, the whole system is better at being careful, but it still happens. And I have seen it. Uh, it's, I, I haven't, it's, it was about 10 years ago but I, I can, a very specific athlete, I, I saw it up close and personal, tried to help, and ultimately that athlete retired. In, in, in case anyone wonders, we are talking here about uh, months of rest without returning to previous level. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, I would say it's very rare now. And yeah. That's good. that's good, you know, obviously. But, but overreaching and stagnation is not rare at all it's in fact i would probably say that that's very very common yeah. that's w where my question comes from because i'm i'm younger and i haven't seen any case of of overtraining as it is stated in the literature so i was wondering if in your case was okay that's that's an important take also okay we have mentioned briefly power meters and um, their role in in the training process and here I would like to talk about internal versus external training load and, you know, the impact that power meters have had on, on the second one. Do you believe that power meters have been a game changer in the, in the world of cycling? Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to say if the, you know, game changer is a big word, but, but uh, it definitely, I, I think it has changed the way they cycle. When I speak with athletes, you know, any, any uh, top cyclist will be very aware of their power outputs. They're, they're getting that feedback in races. It's one of the few variables that are allowed in races at the, at the world tour level, meaning that, you know, they're not allowed to measure glucose or blood pressure or heart rate, you know, a lot of things that maybe they could core temperature. Uh, so power is one of their main feedback, heart rate and, and power. So I think it has had an impact, but the problem is, is that some of the, some of the riders have decided that, well, I don't need to measure anything internal. I don't need to, I need, I can forget about heart rate, forget about perceived exertion. I'm just going to train to power. And that I don't think is a, is a positive development. Would you ban power meters from competition? No, I don't think I'd ban them. Uh, you know, I, I understand there has been discussion about it. It would make the racing more predictable. I mean, less predictable. It'd make the racing more interesting because now athletes are so tuned into their powers, you know, their threshold powers and so forth, that they're racing kind of somewhat constrained by that. They, but I think we still see great racing. I mean, we good grief. We've never seen better racing than we have these days. So, so I don't think it's hurting racing. I think that this has been overstated in the media because in the end, when you work with pro cyclists, normally, well, you have more experience than me, but normally you will see that they have, they can, even in the absence of a power meter, they are very great at mm, knowing the rate of perceived exertion and the, the objective. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that this wouldn't change as much as people believe the, it would, no? Yeah. <laughs> 
anything you do 25 hours a week, you know, you get pretty good at it. So, so. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice summary for the, for the title for the podcast. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, I agree with you 100%. They know their bodies extremely well. Uh, and, and, but the power gives them a calibration. Heart rate can give them a calibration to check and, and, and see. And that's where this thing about being able to both measure the external power, the external work and the internal, trying to have some calibration of saying, well, how is my body responding to that same 350 Watts or, or, you know, and when I use 350 for most of us, that would be something close to our maximum six minute power. But for these athletes, it can be something close to their first threshold power. Uh, you know, and that's the facts. That's how much better they are. You know, 350 Watts is the first, now they finally start to produce some lactate. <laughs> they go from one to 1. 1.6, you know, and now they're at 340, 350. So, and I, you know, some of the guys I've talked to, that's where they're at. And um, so, so obviously, but, but also they get tired. Also, they have day, bad days. Also, they have to pay attention. And then they're going to be looking at perceived exertion. They're going to be looking at heart rate. How am I, you know, are the brakes on? Is my body in need of an extra a day of rest and things? So I do think that we need to measure both, you know, internal, external. I, I, I know this is a weird question, but I want to know your take about this. If you had to choose one single metric to train somebody, which one would you choose? Power, heart rate, blood lactate, perceived exertion? Probably perceived exertion. If I only had one. Yeah. You only I had to use that every day. Yeah. Then I would want to make my athlete learn their body, you know, and really understand because when in the in the final outcome of it, that's that's the best device they have is their brain. Um, so yeah, I would still be and and the research still indicates that the brain is sensitive to these small changes that say I'm getting tired, and those those changes are come earlier than hormonal changes or even you know heart rate can go up and down, so it can be confusing. Uh, you know you can manage to hold powers for days. But, but it's getting tougher, you know, so I still think perceived exertion is a really important tool. Yeah, as an example, in one of the previous episodes, I interviewed uh, the female uh, world champion in trial running, and she told me that she basically trained based exclusively on, on rate of perceived exertion. I, I know that in trial running, we have several problems to monitor, uh, for example, power output, which is an attempt now, but still in the early phase. But yeah, so I and think, think that... about Kenyan runners and, and Ethiopian runners. And if they have a heart rate monitor, that will be about the most advanced piece of equipment they will have. But many of the time, most of the time they're going on feel. So, so, and, and we know that they're breaking world records doing that <laughs> kind of thing. So it's clearly possible. Okay. Last question, Stephen, uh, I think that uh, endurance training uh, comes and goes in trends. So, for example, I, I remember several years ago we have like we had like a huge trend of high intensity interval training, and the you know the race of CrossFit, etc. In the last two to three days uh, years, especially after COVID, I have seen like a huge race in zone two training, this low intensity training. Many people talking about it, and many studies performed on it. Do you really think that it it's just another trend or is it really that magical or is it just in line with what you have provided in your previous studies that show that, you know, the, the volume at low intensity is really the key to performance? What What's your take on it? Well, yeah, I, you know, Inigo uh, Somayon Milan has, has talked about zone two. In my world, zone two, the way he describes it is still in that, under lactate threshold zone but it's a you're basically saying that the green zone or that area you're 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 pushing up a little bit closer to the the first threshold uh, it's it's not a super clear definition for me where zone one ends and zone two begins because i don't believe there's a, cl a very clear physiological definition of the distinction but but they're both in that aerobic low lactate region so in that sense 
it's a it's a positive message. The only problem might be that some people are going to interpret zone two uh, that they say they have to be really up next to the edge of their threshold, and then they go over. <sighs> Because when athletes make a mistake in training, it's almost always that they push too hard, not that they go too easy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Recreational athletes, they, they don't hit the wall. They don't stagnate because they go too easy. They, go, they stagnate because they go too hard. And then they don't recover and, and they have other stresses in their life and they just kind of stagnate. Uh, doing lots of short, hard workouts. Uh, you have mentioned uh, threshold because we have yeah, like three or five or even even seven zones definitions. Yeah. Do you do you really believe in these thresholds, or we are just talking about physiology physiology as a continuum? No, I, I mean definitely you can measure pretty clear breakpoints physiologically now they're not they're not exactly precise but they're, they're a bit fuzzy but they are they're if you're good at doing your testing uh and if you have athletes that are fairly well trained they can be quite quite precise quite clear now if you're testing untrained people or if people that aren't very well trained they've been doing a lot of mixed intensities what we see is they do not have that very clear flat portion of their curve they tend to kind of just go up from the start but if they're if their intensity discipline gets better if their low intensity stays low and that then in a period of six or eight weeks they their profile changes a lot and it starts to look more like the profiles of elite endurance athletes not the absolute watts but the the shape so so i i still i do think that It's it's more about the clients we have. You know, the if you if you test well trained athletes, man, it's it's just really it can be just so clear the, those break points. But it's because they are, they have really good metabolic control. Well, this is very interesting. So, would you suggest using different protocols when measuring gas exchange or lactate in? highly trained versus moderately or untrained uh, subjects? Well, I would, in, in some ways, I would say, well, I'm not going to do a lactate profile on a, a beginner athlete, someone that hasn't done anything. I'm first going to kind of get them down the road, six weeks of training, try to get them to train just really easy at first, you know, do a little bit, get their, just start getting past that initial phase because until we get some training in their body, It's like that lactate profile just doesn't tell us much of anything. Uh, no. Does that make sense? So they're yeah. just so they're, they're just not ready. Their their musculature is not ready. Uh, we don't get a good picture, and, and basically the picture we get is they don't have metabolic control. Everything turns on as soon as they go out the door, um, and they don't have that that flat phase. So that's really the first thing I want to see is can I. Can I get this athlete to the point or this young, this person that started training so that we can actually find a baseline, find a, 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 an intensity where their, their uh, lactate stays low and their heart rate flattens out. Those are my two. I want to see that flat heart rate, which means, hey, I've got it under control. I'm in a, in a steady state si situation. That's, that doesn't happen in, when they first start exercising. But it, but it comes. Within six or eight weeks, we start to see it. Okay. Will you say that the, this first um, visible adaptation to training occur after six to eight weeks? I mean, you, you see some things almost immediately, but, but uh, you start to get, a, they, they get into a habit. Their bodies start to show some adaptations. The, the initial soreness phase is, it goes away. You know, they just, yeah, I think six to eight weeks is a good starting point that now we're ready to really train. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. That's But perfect the first, explanation. <laughs> the first six to eight weeks, you really shouldn't try to do interval training or anything like that. You should mainly just get the body used to that, you know, because it's a huge change to go from not doing anything yeah. to an hour running or an hour cycling, right? Yeah. That's a big change. So let's do that first, you know. Okay, all this conversation evolved around low-intensity training, uh, the importance on volume. 
And in several of your of your papers, I have seen that this has a huge limitation, which is if you want to perform lots of training hours at low intensity, you need motivation. And yeah, yeah. and this I, I would I would like you to provide like one, two, or three bullet points uh, to keep you know like to keep in mind for the amateur athlete who wants to to increase his training hours. You know, right. Well, it's it's everything we've ever seen about doing anything well is the process has to be enjoyable. And so one of the things we see is that, I, you know, when I talk with elite athletes, they say, yeah, you know, we train hard, but we also have fun. And especially on our long rides, we'll stop for coffee. We, you know, we're laughing and talking to each other. So there's some camaraderie. There's a social environment. Uh those long, easy runs, you can talk to each other, you can enjoy the environment around you because you can be distracted. That's one of the nice things about low intensity work is your brain doesn't have to zero in and focus on everything that's happening in your body. It can be looking out and seeing the green grass and the spring flowers. So, you know, when I hear from these wonderful athletes like Kipchoga or uh, Kylian Jornet, they are tied into the environment. They love the nature that they're getting to train in. They see that as a, as a joy that they're, they, they're allowed to be out in nature often. So, so I think that's one of the things I would encourage our uh, recreational athletes to, to think about is enjoy it, enjoy being outside and, or, or whatever you're, you know, that environment you're in. Uh, don't just think of it as work. Because uh, even the best athletes in the world, they don't think of it as, as just work. They love being outside and, and being able to do what they do. Okay. And, there, and there are some hard days, of course. Yeah. But all the days can't be hard. So a good, good advice would be do whatever you want, but that must be something that will keep you training in the long term, no? the, the concept of adherence. Yeah, I think endurance is not just endurance uh, physiologically, but it's a long term, you know, it's a long game. I, hopefully, I'm going to still be cycling when I'm 75 years old. I'm still going to be using my body, I hope, if I live that long. So that means I have to think about how to make it long game, sustainable, right? Perfect. I think that that's a very nice summary for this conversation. Again, many, many thanks, Stephen, for, for accepting the invitation. For me, it was uh, a pleasure to, to have you here and hope uh, someday we'll talk again uh, in my yeah. podcast. Well, many, thank many you. thanks. Thank you for the I, good questions. Bye-bye <laughs> to all. <laughs>